the public hearing regarding the waiver of certain statutory surplus property requirements. We have one public comment. Larry Berry. Larry Berry, I'm at 3973 Brown Street in Oceanside. Um, this, this is one of the pet peeves I have about the Oceanside Unified School District, and that is that you are, um, you know, we're having a fire sale on some of the properties here. We've already Pacifica, we're going to be Garrison, and you're looking for waivers and, and trying to slim this thing down and, and push this material out. Um, you know, one of the, the biggest problem with uh, most of our schools is the failure to do maintenance on them, and we've seen that at Garrison. Um, Garrison was a, you know, a good little neighborhood school, and now they're shipping these kids all over the place. Um, I recommend a long-term lease to that property because we don't know the dis what's going to happen in the future here and about, uh, you know, um, what happens in 20 years from now, and the population may grow and swing and what we're going to do. So we'd like to get some there, you know, the planning, this way we don't lose it forever. Because if we got to pay for this property again, when we do have, we're going to, it's, it's going to cost a fortune. So I recommend the lease and stuff out of that. Um, as far as trying to ask for these waivers, um, I have a, a pretty good friend. Um, his name is Leon Page. He's an attorney. He sues school districts and uh, Miracosta College. Remember that a few years ago in uh, some other, you know, other schools in L.A. and Orange County he's had been tremendous success. And one of the things I like to do is to have uh, uh, him, I'm probably going to give him some seed money to stop this uh, from uh, this kind of giveaway and the taxpayers. My biggest fear is what you're going to do and what you're planning to do is take this money and then put it into the general fund. And we'll never see it again. And, uh, you know, it never goes back to the taxpayers. And it's going to go into who knows what and mismanagement of the money. So I'd like to see us uh, uh, lease the property, either knock the buildings down, lease the, you know, just the, the uh, physical plants, whether the, uh, the garrison or, um, you know, well, just garrison alone. It's just lease it out so that we can use this property in the future if we have to. So I just hope you can do that. And um, again, the general fund and, uh, and and the other thing too is um, I don't know how we use consultants in here and stuff. And I'm always amazed that I've been doing this for 25 years and it's amazing to me that people don't have a uh, you know real understanding of what's happening. And we've been giving away property in Oceanside for 20 years and we don't see the profit in it and uh, we lose everything and and you just keep going to the well for the taxpayers and we keep paying thank you very much thank you do we have any more public comment i'm going to close it at 6 58 p.m we have one public comment on this item patty k Good evening. I've been here since 1952 in Oceanside. I have participated in Hispanic birthdays, in celebrations, in classrooms. We have had Hispanics come from Tijuana to board at school that I went to. Uh, we did not need to proclaim a whole month. So that is my perspective, Mr. Sparks. And I, I understand that being here a few years and looking through a different lens and fulfilling your, your job as equity, diversion, whatever exactly the title is, may give you a different perspective. But I want to assure you that uh, during my time here, we have embraced the Hispanic culture, and I take issue with the paragraph, and I would like to request that it be modified in the proclamation. I think the proclamation is fine. As I said, we embrace them. 
the paragraph indicates, whereas this is only a small step of many that we need to take to be truly inclusive and supportive of our Latinx students and their families. I think that that strongly implies, Mr. Sparks, that we have not included them, and I take exception to that. So therefore, have, having been a longtime resident, having many Hispanic friends, having socialized with many Hispanics, uh, from a long-range view, I would like that modified that, in that part of the proclamation. Anyone else? We have one public comment on this item. Katie Taylor. Just so we don't have any confusion, I love it when the audience is here. We have 31 public comments tonight. I'm excited about that. I want to make sure that everyone can hear your comments and the community. So if you guys could be quiet and not make any interruptions while well, she has three minutes to speak, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I'm confused by this policy that you're presenting here. Seems this policy must be very redundant. There's numerous policies that address all the issues listed in this uh, outline. And it's just, and I'll be real honest with you, I think it's just another power play by Superintendent Vitality. Unless some specific incident or problem exists that's new, that warrants this new policy, then I'm not sure why we need it. And I expect the board will rubber stamp it, as usual. We have a school board, but there's really only one person making all the decisions, and that's Superintendent Vitelli. All right. I'm going to assume you're done. All right. Do we have all right. My favorite part of the night, we have public comments on non-agenda items. We have 31 of them. So me doing my basic math, 31 times 3, that's a little over 90 minutes of public comment. I'm just letting you know. So it's currently 7.41 right now. I'm going to go for 30 minutes, and then we might need to take a quick five-minute biology break because we've been sitting for a while. You guys can get up and go, but we are having a hard time with that. So we'll go ahead and get started. I just want to remind you that we are happy to receive your comments. We actually look forward to hearing from our community. Each person has three minutes total. You'll see the time up on the screen. I please ask that you adhere to that time and um, stay within those time frames. I also want to remind the audience that even though we like what they're saying, let's try to keep it calm so we can finish hearing their entire statement. So go ahead, Ann. Call them up. Okay, I'm going to call up the first five. The topic of discussion is increase in cost of living for teachers. Tiffany Ortega, Laura Evinger, Sharita Shook, Shannon Downey, and Victoria Mariani. Good evening, OUSD School Board, leadership, colleagues, and community. I am Tiffany Ortega. I am the Oceanside Teachers Association president, and I'm here tonight to speak specifically about the personal cost of living increases that our teachers have experienced. We did a survey, and we'll be reading some of those responses that, that um, the teachers gave in that survey. You have all received a packet, and we'd like to read through those because we think it's important that the public hear these things. So the question was, if your personal cost of living has increased, please share some of the things that contribute to that. Rent, birth of a child, groceries, groceries, gas prices, college tuition, taxes, basic goods, child in college, groceries, amount of items having to buy for students, teaching a new grade level and many students at least one grade below, so having to buy learning centers for them so that they can learn. Purchased a new house near my school because rent for a one-bedroom was getting over $2,000 a month. It would be easier to list what hasn't increased in price. Literally everything is more expensive. Cost of gasoline, children, groceries, tech costs, utility costs, student loans, 
medical costs, taxes, daycare costs. My rent has increased. My groceries, toiletries have gone up by about 5%. Pet insurance has increased. And I have a car payment now, among other things. Rent, utilities, groceries, gasoline, insurance, clothing, school supplies, tech support. Mortgage, property taxes, gas, living costs such as food, household expenses, home insurance, car insurance, groceries, utility, gasoline, had to purchase a laptop for distance learning. Kids began preschool, which has increased every year, especially during COVID. New utility rates, groceries, therapy, dealing with the emotional fatigue of my job. I'm going to stop there because I want my colleagues to be able to read as well. But I'm going to tell you that these things have been, we asked our, our teachers these things because we're asking, asking for a cost of living allowance increase, the same one that was applied to your budget. That's what we've asked for in our proposal. That's what we want. I'm going to yield my time. So just okay. for a point of clarification, you can't yield your time. But if she's a, you have your own public comment, right? OK, so you're, you get three minutes as well. So okay. we'll start the clock over. Great. Good evening, OUSD School Board, leadership, colleagues, and community. I am Chetty Doshuk. I'm a speech pathologist at Laurel Elementary. My rent has gone up by close to 30% over the last few years. Utilities are more expensive, especially considering the amount of work I do at home and the electricity and internet this requires. I had to upgrade my internet last year to keep up with Zoom, and now the plan I use to have doesn't exist, so I'm stuck paying more. My mom and dad both lost their jobs during COVID, so I'm helping them out as much as I can. But I'm also trying to save up so someday I can maybe afford a house. I just got married and had a budget wedding, but a lot of the stuff I did, I had to DIY because paying for something like a planner or a coordinator or having real flowers was not something that was affordable with everything else going on. We are living comfortably right now, but if I had kids, I, if I had kids and was trying to budget for that, I don't know if we'd be okay. I feel like we are constantly one injury away from not being financially stable. Groceries due to COVID, senior child, electric bills due to vital learning for my kids and teaching online, uploading lessons, et cetera. College expenses, utilities, taking care. Let me know when my time's up. I guess it'll beep, right? Um, older older live-in relatives. My rent has been raised, the price of gas, groceries have gone up, electricity has gone up, helping my own children survive the pandemic, assisting my mother due to pandemic and health issues mortgage, utilities, groceries, paying more for a better internet plan due to distance learning, utilities, groceries, gas, out-of-pocket health care costs, home and car insurance, the cost of classroom supplies, check out the consumer price index, child care, daycare costs increase every year, grocery prices increase, water, electricity, price increases, spouse illness, only one working, loss of income, utility increase, lost renters income, food, gas, anything house related that needs fixing, anything for leisure, movies, restaurants, flights, hotels, rental cars. This one's a little long, so this is my own. And in my own research, consumer price index in San Diego as of July 2021 was up 6.0. Next speaker. Uh, good evening, board leadership and Superintendent Vitale. My name is Laura Evinger, and I'm a teacher at King Middle School. Um, other things that are affecting teachers now, groceries, kids in college, school expenses not covered by the district, groceries, fuel, utilities, homeowners insurance, rent, utilities, college-age children, medical diagnosis, groceries and insurance, rent, groceries, gas, medical care, more frequent co-pays, chiropractic care, mental health care, groceries, gas, child care, New home, bigger mortgage, day for, daycare for kids under five, groceries for family, rent, gas, groceries. Uh, statement from a colleague, I moved here two years ago and just had to sign a new lease that is $1,300 more than I was paying. The rental market has skyrocketed and it took me four months to not get out, outbid by someone with cash for a rental. Also, no one, is, no one was able to get evicted due to COVID and people are buying houses with cash offers above asking price. 
This leaves the rental market inventory super low. Retaining educators to the area for work should be key, and if there are no houses we can afford, we will seek other locations. Uh, again, utilities, groceries, gas, home insurance, their main increases, utilities and groceries, gas, groceries, gas, electricity, water, insurance, property theft, medical, technology, internet, children, increase in evaluated property taxes, gas prices, cost of food, higher energy bills due to additional time at home, increased rent, groceries, new electronics for teaching, children in college, divorce, rent, utilities, groceries, insurance, groceries, utilities, and student loans. And just speaking quickly on my own personal story, I can tell you that my husband was a business owner for almost 10 years. COVID closed his business. We are currently living on just my income. He's starting a new business, but it takes time. He has been out of work since January. And, uh, you know, any bit helps. It was hard for them to close their doors, but COVID made them. So a lot of teachers have experience with this, and one spouse is only working now. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening, OUSD board, school board, leadership, colleagues, and community. My name is Shannon Downey, and I'm a teacher at Oceanside High School. And I'm here tonight to, to speak regarding increase in cost of living for tenant, for teachers by sharing responses from our recent member survey. Living expenses and classroom expenses, including, including having to purchase a $1,700 MacBook to teach remotely, since there was no plan to give us devices as of 7 2020. And I needed to relearn how to do my job by asking colleagues to train me. Groceries, haircuts, dining out, clothing, rent, utilities, gas, rent, groceries, and insurance costs have increased. Rent, utilities, food costs, childcare, tuition, rent, utilities, gasoline, groceries, medical expenses, auto insurance, rent, utilities, gas, groceries, technology needs. Utili utilities, especially electricity, water, and internet, groceries, property taxes, insurance, utilities, grocery, groceries, gas, internet upgrades, new laptop to be able to teach virtually, fuel, gas for car, utilities, grocery, property ta taxes, etc. Rent, gas, and auto repair insurance, food, go uh, goods and services, and wages for outsourced work like childcare and cleaning services, higher prices of groceries, gas, restaurants, utilities of water, natural gas, electri electricity has risen. Groceries, utilities, kids' sports, gas, home appliances, gasoline, groceries, groceries including meat, utilities, helping parents, school supplies, mortgage payment, and car payment. Rent, utilities, groceries, gas, clothing, transportation, parking, entertainment. Children and higher level sports, utilities, groceries, gas. Utility, insurance for cars, home, groceries, food, medicines, college, fees, tech upgrades for work. Utilities, groceries, transportation, technology. Utilities, groceries, air purifiers, child in college. Gas, water, electricity, higher speed internet during virtual teaching, food, two sons in college. Utilities, groceries, gas, groceries, all utilities, gas, rent, automobile costs, childcare, insurance, utilities, mainly electric bill from working from home, utilities, gas, groceries, and healthcare. Gas prices, grocery prices, childcare costs, utilities, ongoing education costs. Groceries and SDG&E bill are much higher than a year ago. Daycare for my second child is 30% higher than for my first child. Rent mortgage has doubled. As my son grows, groceries and others related expenses go up every year. And this I'm going to um, go ahead and pass this on to a colleague of mine. The time is now for a fair contract. Thank you. Next speaker. Hi, I'm Victoria Mariani. I've been teaching this district 21 years, grades K through 6, and I'm here advocating tonight for a pair contract by sharing responses from our ODA survey. According to many teachers, groceries, utilities, children, college, uh, our prices have gone up, gasoline, car insurance, college tuition, groceries, insurance, utilities, etc. Here's some things that contribute to cost of living going up for teachers, groceries, computers, printers, gasoline, college-age children's school supplies, rent, three children under the age of five, groceries, gas, groceries, gas, technology devices, food costs, energy costs, 
My child's sports and travel expenses, groceries and restaurant prices have doubled. Clothes and shoes and sports equipment have all gone up in price. Gas, groceries, utilities, rent utilities, groceries, child and before after school care, sanitation items, school supplies, food, clothing, gasoline, utilities, cleaning supplies, medical supplies, pay extra for my electric bill, mortgage and groceries, college costs for my daughter, utilities, groceries, gasoline, everything that I buy has gone up. Child care, 12,000 per month, groceries, Sorry, 1200 per month, groceries 1200 per month, mortgage 4000 per month, utilities about $1,200 per month. Water bill, gasoline, cable, groceries, gasoline, utilities, groceries have doubled, college tuition, clothing costs for family, children in college, gas bills increase, water bill increase, groceries more expensive, meat, gas, water, electricity, car repair, internet utilities, children in college, gas, groceries, insurance, cable, water, all caps, increased utilities, food costs, expenses for kids at home, Groceries, gas, taxes, college tuition, water bill, electric bill. Gas is up to $5 per gallon. Everything is expensive, and I have two kids in college. Since rent got too expensive here in Oceanside, I had to move farther away from work, more inland. With gas prices increasing and worsening traffic conditions, the commute is turning to be extra tiring and expensive. Utilities such as water, better internet service for island instruction, more gas and electricity are some of my increasing costs. I literally just renewed my lease with the rent increase. Every half of a year, my rent goes up. It's getting harder and harder to cover bills while trying to save to one day become a homeowner. A homeowner. Several of my family members lost their jobs during the pandemic, so I helped cover some of their expenses. I wouldn't let my family get kicked out of the, onto the streets because I'm not married or have kids. I don't receive financial help from the state, and I didn't get a tax return. It's extremely unfair that someone who wants to pursue their dream of becoming a teacher gets financially screwed over because people that don't live in my shoes think a teacher's salary is enough to sustain a living here in Southern California. The reality is a very difficult and stressful one. Even though I struggle financially, I still buy my student supplies because we don't get financial help for a class of 30 plus students, a large class during a worldwide pandemic. I bought a new home, so now I have a mortgage. I have two boys in college. My mom was recently diagnosed with lupus and heart disease, so we are making arrangements for her to come and stay with us. Groceries are more expensive when I have a son applying to college, utilities, groceries, insurance, college expenses, mortgage, utilities, groceries, student loan payment, groceries, cleaning supplies, preschool fees, medical expenses, and mortgage. The time is now for a fair contract. Thank you. The next five speakers, Christopher Felix, topic ethnic studies, Kathy Rolden, topic mandates, Emily Wichman, topic ethnic studies, Kathy Ahenger, topic salary slash work expectations. Oh, sorry about that. And then Frank Zhu, topic ethnic studies and CRT. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Christopher Felix. I grew up in Oceanside. My mother and I came to Oceanside in 1999 homeless. We stayed in a homeless shelter on San Diego Street, among other shelters. I attended and graduated from Oceanside High School, Go Pirates. Joined the Navy in 2004 because of the emotional impact of 9-11. I did construction for a while when I got out, attended Maricosta College, and then transferred to San Diego State. Two years later, I graduated from San Diego State, and now I am a program manager for a military contractor in Carlsbad. My wife and I bought our first home, and today is actually our home anniversary. Um, I said all that to say I had choices to make in life. I chose to succeed. Throughout adversity and storms in my life, I had choices to make, but I was never the victim, nor was I ever oppressed in any shape or form. This ethnic studies course is a barbaric, twisted, unethical landmine that you're attempting to plant in our children's hearts. It will destroy our nation if it takes root. Let me explain. It teaches the dynamics of internal, 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 internalized interpersonal and institutional oppression. If there's oppression, then there must be an oppressor and an oppressee. I'll let you figure out who that is. Oh wait, it's whiteness. It teaches whiteness and the privileges that are tied to being white. That being white gives you power and privilege. Superintendent, I refuse to believe that the position you're in is because of the color of your skin. 
that you were given an unfair advantage over other people of color that were somehow oppressed by your whiteness. I firmly and truly believe you worked hard for where you are today, ma'am. But this curriculum teaches otherwise. It teaches that whiteness gives you a privilege o over other people of color. And that's a lie. But it's in the outline. I took this straight from the outline. The course teach goes on to teach there's, there's a dominant and a subordinate group. The course asks, why does race matter? Why does race matter? Why does it matter? It should. Why are we so concerned about the color of our skin? And why can't we judge each other on the content of our character? I guess, guess who said that? Thank you. It teaches that discrimination in today shapes our lives. No, it doesn't. Our choices shape our lives. Our parents' choices influence our lives. Discrimination does not shape lives today. Why are we stuck in the past? We cannot move forward unless we leave this mess behind. It teaches that the prison system and capitalism work together to keep people of color in prison. And I know it's a hard fact to accept, but most crime is done by people of color in this nation. Thank you. Your time is up. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Good evening. My name is Kathy Roldan. I come here tonight. I am an employee, but I come in a different role. I come as a minister. And um, I just wanted to give you a different perspective on um, you're in charge of the scholars, and I am in charge of their souls and the family's souls. And both, we can agree, shouldn't be taken lightly. Recently, I counseled a doctor who is going through quite a dilemma with her employer wanting to um, enforce, and especially enforce after last week's extra mandates coming down from the government. And um, her dilemma is that she swore an oath to no, do no harm to anyone, and yet she was being forced to be harmed, in her opinion. Uh, knowing the risks of the side effects, and coupled with her moral co conscience of taking it, sorry, it's hard being short, should she comply, go along to get along, or not comply and risk her family's financial stability. We discuss the options and we discuss that sometimes we make decisions that are scary and uncomfortable and we put our faith in God because providence steps in when we let go of that fear. And that's what prompted me to come tonight. It was because it reminded me of a conversation I had with my own daughters about what I wanted to be remembered by and that was for standing up for others' rights. And then I thought about my last few months at the district and um, how it's been difficult to go along to get along. Even today, I was bullied for pulling my mask down outside by another employee who thought it was her position to tell me we were too close. Board members and leadership, I know that you're under extreme pressure to adhere to what our federal and state governments are mandating. I can tell you that when COVID hit, I too was afraid. So I turned off my TV and I started researching. I can tell you that I've had over 2,000 hours logged of research. So I'm not telling you this as a theorist, conspiracy theorist or otherwise. I can tell you with 100% confidence that the facts are out there, but they're being withheld. It is the responsibility of all of us to do the research and trust our instincts. Following the science does not mean following the CDC. The CDC has a nonprofit foundation that is being funded by organizations that are uh, pharmaceutical companies, guess who? And uh, just foundations like the Bill and Melinda Gates. So we cannot listen to that as science if there is a biased opinion behind it. Last week we were given on our Wednesday uh, weekly, mis there was a misinformation alert funded again by the same companies. I know you're busy, this is daunting of doing this research, but I think when it comes to scholars and souls, we need to really make this a priority. Also, as a Christian minister, I um, have to say that the masking and social distancing, when you look into that, has its roots in Satanism. Thank so you. by making that... Your time is up. Thank you for your public comment. Thank you for that perspective.
Good evening, school board members, leadership, and community. I am Kathy Ahinger, a teacher in Oceanside Unified School District for the last three decades. I'm here tonight to just share my experiences, as with many of my colleagues, in the difficulty that has been transpiring through COVID-19, and my feelings regarding uh, our recent negotiations. Um, my history comes in spending about 10 years early in my career on the negotiations team. So I understand COLAs, I understand how it works. And when I was in that position, if there was a cost of living increase, it was passed along to all of our members, not just teachers, administrators, our classified staff, because it is a cost of living increase. We all are experiencing those as you've heard from my colleagues speak before. Um, so that's why I'm addressing you today. Um, I'm sad that uh, after all of our staff's hard work uh, has been um, an inability to agree on a fair salary um, settlement for all of our, all of our um, employees, and not only just teachers. Uh, we continue to work endless hours beyond our contract. Um, to meet our students' needs because they're special. I mean, we have all been through this. So it's, it's not something we created, it's not something you created, but we are all living in a pandemic and our kids have been locked away. I teach kindergarten. I have never experienced what I'm experiencing this year. My students are wonderful and loving and caring, but they know nothing about school. They haven't been socialized because they haven't been outside their homes. This is not anything that could be avoided, but it is something that we're all dealing with because our kids are special, more special than ever right now. Um, we are putting in our time for extra training, new communication tools, new curriculums, uh, and, um, that are having and technology that are occurring outside our day. There's an, there's never been a way to finish our job if we do it adequately within our day. Um, money. Since the pandemic began, just some of my personal expenses I to meet my students' needs, I have spent $2,335 on teacher paid teacher for packets to go home to my kids. A total a new, new laptop computer, an iPad, two printers with scanners, um, increased $30 a month internet service, and $5,395 total in extra expenses. So in my 30 years, um, it has been good or bad. Usually uh, funding has been good or bad. And un until now, I think it's been fair. Um, but I urge you to direct the district negotiation team to offer a generous salary to show the employees that they're valued, especially with a fully funded cost of living increase that has been in the past given fully to staff because it keeps us where we are. It maintains our ability to pay our bills and stay in our committee. Thank, Thank you for you. listening. <laughs> Superintendent, board members, I'm here to report to you the meeting that I that Graham Frazier and I had with Dr. Batali and Dr. Lawrence on August the 11th about Oceanside Ethnic Studies. I presented several resources which showed a narrow lens or perspective of information superintendent said she didn't understand. I asked for a committee to evaluate the resources materials from Oceanside Ethnic Studies. I was shut down, but I was offered to have my materials given to the committee so they could look it over. I also asked for the categories of who was on this committee, but I have not received it yet. I suspected the superintendent did not understand and I, what I had presented, then the committee didn't understand and the board does not understand the contents of Oceanside's ethnic studies. According to analysis by California Equal Rights, Oceanside Ethnic Studies is filled with, with a much con con contested uh, critical race theory. So I'm referencing to your California School Board Ethnic Studies uh, publication, FAQ, in uh, July 2021. And this publication uh, gives, gives you um, additional background on critical race theory. This publication answers how uh, critical race theory is related to the California Ethnic Studies model curriculum. And it makes clear, let me quote, the state's model curriculum is intended to provide guidance to school districts 
It does not require any specific concepts such as CRT to be incorporated in ethnic studies. It also answers the question, is CRT Marxist? And I quote, CRT was developed by left-leading scholars, some of whom were neo-Marxist, but not inherently Marxist. So what does that mean? So I looked it up. And, and what do neo-Marxists believe? And this, I got this quote from Oxford Languages. Neo-Marxists believe the economic system creates a wealthy class of owners and a poor class of, of workers. They also believe that certain social institutions, such as churches, prisons, and schools, have created to maintain the division between the powerful and the powerless. Is this what Oceanside ethnic studies lens and perspective is tuned to, dividing by race and people? I am requesting the governing board of education for the Oceanside Unified School District direct staff to start the procedure to form a committee for, uh, for the purpose to make it our own ethnic studies using policies 1312.2, uh, complaints concerning instructional material, policy 6141, 6142.3.94, uh, 6144.1220 and the state uh, code 60044. There are many models. Oh, goodness. There are many models. What I would ask that this committee could create their own guiding principles to Thank work by. Thank you for your okay. public comment. All righty. Thank you. Oh. I've, I've got one more. Is that okay? okay. Uh, no, no. Well, you have one public comment, and you just used be, your three minutes to switch in. Sorry, who's did they, next, did please? No? Did they say no? No, we do not do that. Okay. Your person needs to be present to make a public comment, but I appreciate your enthusiasm. Okay, well, she's bedridden, but she wanted to speak. Thank you. So please be careful what this ideology will lead our next generations to. So we analyzed all 18 units of OUSD's approved ethnic studies courses. They are all biased towards critical race theory resources, an oppressor versus victim narrative a power and a privilege lens and a focus on political awareness building. So this lent toward a particular worldview and a special kind of ethnic studies rooted in CRT is unconducive for diversity of sorts to flourish in OUSD. And unopposed implementing a critical ethnic uh, study, studies course means that civic engagement will give in to racial di divisions. An effective communication and a holistic development will be replaced by a strong sense of disempowerment. Lifelong learning will be overshadowed by political indoctrination, and it is a race to the bottom. So in closing, I encourage you to go on www.rejectcrt.org, which is empowered by CIFR, and read the joint, joint uh, statement made by a diverse coalition of 25 organizations in firm opposition to critical race theory and its real-life applications, including critical ethnic studies. Thank, Thank you, you for your public comment. The next seven speakers will speak on Teachers' Current Workday. 
Patricia Ramirez, Lisa Farrell, Avelina Apolinar, Wendy Peterson, Kate Vinson, Nelson Cohen, and Christina Holman. Okay, good evening, OUSD School Board, leadership, colleagues, and community. I am Patricia Ramirez, and I'm here tonight to speak regarding teacher workload by sharing responses from our recent member survey. This is from a member. Hectic. I worry about keeping my kids socially distanced, sanitized enough, making sure that my TKs can make it to the bathroom on time because it's about 30 yards away from my classroom, and they have to go by themselves. Dealing with my four kids on IEPs, one that should be an MM, making sure that the IS is correct for my kids and given on time when they have to be out for at least 10 days, then worry that they haven't spread anything to the rest of the class or to me, making sure that my masks stay on, that student masks stay on, and that I have extras just in case, making sure that the kids don't share any tools, such as pencils, crayons, STEM materials, etc. Another member, I'm, try I'm trying to only work contract hours, but find that I must work an additional eight hours on the weekend to be prepared to teach my combo class. Due to the varied levels of students that are in my class, I'm forced to prep for teaching third through fifth at minimum. I'm overwhelmed and under-supported. Last year, I had more time spent on communication with families and checking in on students. I'm working two to three evenings at home after my own children have gone to sleep in order to prepare for the day ahead and complete IEPs. I work in special education, and as our students' needs have increased and district supports decreased this year, with the other ed specialist being put in a split position, I can't complete my job in my contract day. Our current caseload is not indicative of the workload. I arrive at school around 6.45 a.m. I stay at work until close to 5 p.m. I take papers home to grade later. I spend some time on Saturday grading and planning, and usually three to five hours at school on Sunday preparing for the week. From another member, massive numbers of disrespectful, unprofessional OUSD emails that have links elementary teachers are expected to click and train themselves on or troubleshoot technology. Blatant disregard that trainings of new programs teachers are required to use should be held on first or third Wednesdays as per contract, more parent emails than ever to respond to, more kids way behind that need both social and academic support, no funding for supplies kids desperately need and families cannot afford, limited copies at some school sites, but unlimited at others, no art or music for all K-3 through three students when expressing themselves as desperately needed during our still going on pandemic, no respect and concern by OUSD leadership to limit emails sent to teachers, OUSD website not maintained, not user friendly. The time is now for a fair contract. Thank you. Good evening, Oceanside School Board members, leadership, colleagues, and community. I'm Lisa Farrell, a teacher and a parent in our school district. Um, I'm going to share some more responses from our recent member survey. Disinfecting services in the morning, making sure there are plenty of masks and wipes, lack of freedom with students seating, the lack of ability to move students as needed to create a better environment. Constantly reminding students to cover their noses and mouths, teaching through a mask, keeping distance from colleagues, no field trips, assemblies, plays, music presentations, no volunteers, back to school night and parent conferences on Zoom, digital work for all the students out due to illness, Current use of PPE, having to start doing short independent study contracts adds to my work off contract hours. I spend most of my prep answering emails and posting assignments for students who are quarantined. I don't have time during most days to prepare for my in-person students. I spend one to two additional hours preparing for the next day. There's so much more work now. The addition of Google Classroom and providing extra work, time, and effort with my students who have been in contact with COVID. There is a daily, no minutely, fear of COVID exposure. And what does the district do? Collapse classes and increase class size. In a year where COVID is surging and we have more below grade level students than ever. That's abhorrent. 
It is difficult to teach young children who are wearing masks. It's difficult to hear them, and you can't tell if they're enunciating or forming their letter sounds correctly. And you just cannot socially distance yourself from a young child who needs academic assistance. Additionally, there are so many daily tasks that we've previously had parent help with, project prep, photocopying, clerical work, working with students, et cetera. And we cannot have volunteers in the classroom, so more work falls on our shoulders. With zero district support or training for our new technology, we've had to muddle through our new devices and the students' new devices, many who did not know how to log into their new devices that they just received last week with iReady in progress and several devices that did not recognize the students' credentials and had to have a password reset that we barely learned at the 11th hour. Get to work, put the mask on, have a hard time breathing all day, strain my voice, talk, use the voice amplifier I bought before the district, bought the ones for us, sanitize myself and students multiple times a day, deal with things the nurse used to deal with because we don't want to send them up to get infected if someone's sick, wipe down tables with disinfectant wipe, ask students all day long to mask up, find their mask, get them a mask, worry about kids getting sick, not being told kids are in quarantine, worry about if we're going to have to pivot to virtual with a new system since I'm in a new grade level with a new platform, worried my Chromebook won't work at school. <laughs> the time is now for a fair contract. Thank you. Good evening, OUSD school board leadership, colleagues, and community. I am Avelina Apolinar. I am a teacher at Libby. I am here tonight to speak regarding teachers' current workdays by sharing responses from our recent member survey. I have watched colleagues who have had to quarantine with their entire class, work hard, gather pertinent materials, only to have most work come back unfinished or classroom books, materials unreturned. They can't even start their first day back in the classroom as they like because of missing books, etc. Because of all we've endured so far this school year, four weeks of school has felt like four months. 30 minutes of prep is just not enough. Lots of juggling, lots of explaining to the parents what the district is sending out. Just changed jobs on Monday, so everything different. Technology keeps me working longer. Checking email, Google Classroom, Seesaw, Aludo to learn. Technology frustrations, nothing ready in classrooms. Took two to three weeks after school started to get technology set up at the teacher, at the teacher desk, doc cam and projector working. More prep time would be highly beneficial at elementary level. I work through lunches, recesses, plus come early and stay after contract hours. There's still not enough time to get everything done. So I end up working at least eight to 10 more hours on Saturday or Sunday. I am working later hours because I have to plan for in-person instruction and independent study contracts for students who need to self-quarantine, self-isolate. I also need to create longer-term emergency subplans in the event that I or my daughter need to self-quarantine. I bring more work home during the weekday and typically stay up to at least 11 p.m. working on schoolwork. Also, this is the first year out of 23 years of teaching where I went to school to work in my classroom during the weekend. I will put my personal point here as well. I get up, I, go to, I get home from school at 7 p.m. most of the time. I go to bed as I'm eating my dinner, fall asleep on the couch. I wake up at 12, one o'clock in the morning to still keep working to get my lesson plans done or my lessons for the next day for my kids in class in independent study and stay up till 4.30, take a nap to go to school and be there on time at 8.25. The time is now for a fair contract. Thank you. My name is Wendy. I'm a teacher at Oceanside High School. I'm here tonight to speak regarding teachers' current work day by sharing responses from our recent member survey. I have multiple students coming and going from quarantine. Parents have requested that I provide work. That takes time to prepare and plan the work and communicate with parents about picking up the work. 
Also, I get questions from students and parents about work that I have sent home, all while trying to teach a five a four five combo, much more stressful. Students have been more needy. Making lesson plans for students in class, students on independent study, creating lessons to use digitally and for in person, troubleshooting technology, issues in class for me as the teacher and for students because their devices aren't working at times. And as high school teacher, I have kids coming without like their Chromebooks being charged, and that's an ongoing issue. Never having a consistent amount of working technology in class for lessons to go as planned. Less academics, more behavior. Prep case management used to help gen ed teachers with behavior instead of doing my own casework. My workload is overwhelming, and I'm not sure how much longer I can keep it up. The increase in class size and the added preps have left me scrambling through my day, trying to um, keep track of what, who I am teaching. On top of this, we have to post work for quarantine students online and communicate with parents about the myriad of problems that come with bringing students back to school full time after spending a year and a half in virtual and hybrid learning. Bottom line, I can't really do my job with the level of competency I would like without putting in 15 hour days, which is something that I don't feel comfortable doing. It's crazy, this morning I had to vacuum my floor because they never get vacuumed. And getting tabletops cleaned rarely happens. During a pandemic, you'd think this would happen daily. My trash wasn't emptied last night. I've had two students out for longer than five days this year, but luckily it was at the beginning of the year and I didn't have to deal with the independent study stuff. Students are very low. I have 24 first graders. Still haven't met the new SPED teacher at our site, and I have two students on IEPs. They just started receiving push-in services on the 30th. Constantly having to tell students to put on masks. And these first graders have never been in real school, so it's like the kinder all over again. And I can say I have 10th graders, and I have students that didn't experience a ninth grade year, and so they're sometimes acting like eighth graders. It's very hard, but the silver lining is that I'm so happy to be at school with students. I get PTSD thinking about having to Zoom again. <laughs> Behavior is tough, working around technology and getting students adjusted. Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening, school board, leadership colleagues, and community. I'm Kate Venza, and I'm here to speak about Teacher Day by sharing responses from our recent member survey. A lot of students are having anxiety about coming back to school. They are catching up from learning gaps from Zoom. I worry a lot more about the safety of my students. The communications from the district have not been clear and protocols for when a class goes in on independent study have not been clear either. I solved technology problems for each child, problems I didn't have before. I am consoling children whose personal earbuds don't work and they refuse to use my classroom supply. I'm repeatedly helping students log into their devices because they don't remember how to do it. Personally, it can take up to 15 minutes per student that you're trying to help get logged in, and then it won't work. I am helping children keep track of their username and passwords to different accounts. I am having to reteach lessons to students who are gone due to quarantine or to due to COVID. My classroom has turned into a revolving door. It is hard to keep track of who is coming and who is going, who is supposed to be here and who is not supposed to be here. I'm having to email parents regarding their quarantine students' assignments. I'm having to write independent studies for students who are out for a few days, several days, 14 days. I have to grade the work the students return. In many cases, the students don't do any of the work that I spent a lot of time putting together for them to do over their quarantine. I am having to figure out how to teach two students who have brought their devices and to the students who have not brought their devices. I have to write separate teaching plans for both of these groups because not everybody brings a charged device or a device to school. So the solution to that would be to have extra devices in the classroom for when students forget their Chromebook or their Chromebook is not charged, 
but uh, Greg Moon decided to take away the extra Chromebooks instead of le having us leave them in the schools. Even some of those Chromebooks were bought with site funds at South O, and they still took some of those away instead of leaving them for us to use when kids forget. I'm having to figure out how students can change their device because we do not have enough extra devices or extra chargers in the classroom. I feel like it cannot be a consistent teacher when my classroom has turned into a revolving door. I have to send many messages home via Blackboard because many of the parents do not check or help their students complete their schoolwork. It is time for a fair contract. Thank you. Next speaker. Thank you. I'm Nelson Cohen from McAuliffe. I've been there for about 12 years now, and I was at Reynolds for around 13 years before that. Thank you for allowing me to work in your district. First of all, the United States of America has been a great country for around 245 years now. And uh, there have been hiccups along the way, but we've worked hard to improve our country. Um, and as far as our um, working conditions, I am, uh, our devices, like Kate said, our devices cannot work with Zoom and start to glitch after 30 minutes. The independent study packets take a lot of time, very, very much time. And it makes me and my colleagues grumpy when the students do not do any of the work. We're constantly having to console students um, and keep them from having an emotional breakdown because of the devices not being charged, not working correctly, not remembering their passwords, not having their own earbuds. Teachers also have emotional breakdowns while trying to assist these students. Believe me, students just seem more on edge and sensitive to anything right now. I feel like I am also a counselor. We all do. This is exhausting. Uh, in addition to creating and engaging in in-person lessons, we're, we're translating them to an accessible format, such as Google Classroom or Seesaw. Uh, our emails include more contacts from students who are quarantined and parents on their behalf. Our work days require about an additional uh, hour of prep per day than they did previously. This time includes arranging flexible, flexible music parts to accommodate the continual fluctuation of students in our music classes, as well as check-ins and constant, uh, excuse me, and content provision for those students working from home. With, there's increased expectation to provide services that were not done last year, such with high caseloads and not enough support, with much more interaction and collaboration with parents. Our workload and preparation for class sizes and accommodations for COVID-19 protocols have not changed. Uh, we're still working 12 plus hours to coordinate curriculum, communication, and accommodate extended quarantine or medical absences without, but without the preparation period or sustained support of coordinated staffing or substitutes, we have lost not only a daily prep to maintain or remain on top of grading, differentiation or social emotional learning support for students, as was bridged in hybrid to build the programs and successes we had. We also cover for our colleagues and team for our prep period almost every day as a result of the lagging uh, issues. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, OUSD School Board leadership, colleagues, and community. I'm Christina Holman, a special education teacher at Southo, and I'm here tonight to speak to you regarding Teacher Workday by sharing responses from our recent member survey. Whew. It's hell because every day I am fearing, I'm fearful of getting COVID from the kids who are allowed to be unmasked at recess instead of having them sit six feet apart at snack and lunch. They are sitting face to face, less than two feet from each other across the table and one inch apart next to each other while eating. More work added to the same contract time. Teachers did everything that the district took credit for as usual. 
I am very busy with higher demands because my position was split, so I work at two school sites. It completely changed my life, personally and professionally. I have to reprogram my curriculum, adjust the classroom for safety, three times already this year, no, provi no time provided to accommodate a one-two combo that was assigned to me the last days of the second week of school. Have to work on Saturday with no compensation. I was given one day that I haven't I was given one day that I haven't taken for the shortage of subs. The regular curriculum continues with most students not ready in all aspects. Most importantly, I am yet to see any administrator at DO to express a concern and talk directly to teachers, not the principal. Everything looks good on paper. Our reality is a different story. Completely overwhelmed. Come early, leave late, and no lunches, no lunch unless I force myself to. Not enough time in the day to do my jobs, and I have to ask. I have had to ask for significant help, and no one has responded. We also have been receiving a lot of district emails outside of work hours, and are constantly being inundated with new training on some new tech or program to complete, which is often a video to watch. This doesn't allow me time to engage in the SST process for students that we are extremely concerned about, or even meet as a grade level team to look at assessments and plans. The level of anxiety and stress I feel is much higher than ever before. I've been teaching it for more than 17 years and I am beyond frustrated with what we as teachers are expected to handle. We are expected to solve problems that are beyond the scope of our expertise, so we, of course, rise to the occasion for the benefit of our students. We figure out how to teach virtually. We figure out how to teach hybrid. We figure out how to teach from quarantine. Time and time again, we teachers of OUSD have figured things out for the benefit of the district. It's time the district figures things out and shows its teachers the respect we deserve. The time is now for a fair contract. Thank you. Before we go on, we're a little over halfway. I'm looking at my board colleagues. We need a 10 minute biology break in order to stay alert so we can continue listening with alertness to the rest of the public comments. So please don't go anywhere. And if you wanna let the next five people know who they are, we will reconvene at 8.47. Will you set a timer for 10 minutes, please? The next five people. 10 will, minute timer? Will be Patty K. No? Okay. I think Kate left, Katie. So Wendy Peterson, Mike, Richardson, Brad Tobias, and Graham Frazier, and then we'll have one more, Rose Higuera. I'll probably have Peterson, and I am kind of wearing two hats um, on the issue of the ethnic studies course. So as a teacher, I am coming here to testify that last I checked, we are teaching reading, writing, and arithmetic. Ac um, according to our graduation requirements, we need four years of English. The state only requires three. Our district requires four. The math requires, um, the state requires two years of math, we require three. So we go above and beyond in terms of what we are asking in terms of reading, writing, and arithmetic courses. Ethnic studies is a one class elective. Students get a choice to take the class. We have only about 20 students enrolled in it. And so it is a choice. It is not a mandated course for students to graduate. So students by no means are required to take that course. They get a choice and we have a slew of other courses that they can choose from as well. I wanted to mention that beyond the, the narrow scope that I think some people have of just our school and district and critical race theory, there is another world out there. 
Um, UC schools require an American culture to graduate and earn a degree and any degree they need to satisfy. Um, here's a little bit. Courses must be at least three semester units or four quarter units. Courses must also take substantial account of groups drawn from at least three of the following African Americans, indigenous peoples of the United States, Asian Americans, Chicanos, Latin Americans, and European Americans. So that's a requirement for UC students to take a course similar to ethnic studies. At Stanford, here are the names of some of the courses that students can choose from. There is also a requirement to graduate from Stanford with something in regards to an ethnic um, studies background. Um, here's one course, Student and Community Organizing for Social Change. Um, let's see, Advanced Methods in Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity. Um, there's another one. Race, Ethnicity, and Linguist Linguistic Diversity. Um, gender in Native American Societies. And uh, Activism. Hmm. Introduction to Feminist Gender and Sexuality Studies. So. This, these are at, I mean, so most universities in the country do ask their students to take a course in something that's going to inform them and create them, um, make them better citizens. Okay. Also, Maricosta College has a cultural diversity requirement for graduation. So we are, in fact, emulating what is happening in universities across the country. Thank you for your public comment. Mike Richardson. <clears throat> As you said, I'm Mike Richardson. I've stood before you uh, in other meetings and told you that when I graduated from Jefferson junior high school, which was called then, I was in the first class. I graduated in 1955. And in that time, there was a requirement that you had to pass a comprehensive test on the Constitution. The classes, our social studies classes, spent the entire year deeply studying the Constitution. And if you didn't pass, you didn't go to high school. I think that lasted for another 25 or 30 years from my, uh, from what I've heard from other students, and then it just sort of mysteriously disappeared. I've asked what happened, and nobody really knows except they say, well, the state has other uh, mandates for you to teach. Well, I passed out um, a copy of the Ramona Union School District to you. It's on your desk. And this is their uh, recent policy decision on uh, civic education, U.S. history. I can't go through the whole thing with you, but I can tell you that at the top of the list is the Constitution and the, De and the Bill of Rights and the De Declaration of Independence. One item that I think I got to read to you, it says, number seven, students shall be taught how the ideologies of communism and totalitarianism conflict with the, with the founding principles of freedom and democracy of the United States. Do you think our kids know that? I don't, I don't hear that. Curriculum shall include first-person uh, accounts from diverse individuals. Okay, I'm going to skip to the section about racism, because that seems to be a hot topic. And incidentally, it's my understanding that there's a proposal in the legislature to require ethnic studies as a high school, uh, for high school graduation, and I think it will be next year or the year after. But this is, uh, on page three of this document, there's a whole list of things that are forbidden. And uh, I would love to read them all. But it says that it, the, t the school is forbidden from teaching that one race or sex is inherently superior to another race or sex. That's forbidden. An individual uh, is forbidden to, to teach that an individual by virtue of his or her race is inherently racist. That's forbidden. 
Why is it allowed today in our schools? I think it's time for you to read this document from Ramona School District. Thank you answer. for your public comment. Next three speakers, Brad Tobias, Graham Frazier, and Rose Higarell. Hello to the board, Superintendent. Uh, thank you. Good evening. Uh, thank you for this time. And to all the teachers, uh, as a parent, thank you for what you, what you do for our children. I appreciate that. Uh, so the purpose of me being up here is threefold. Uh, one, I want to I wanna, um, kind of follow up in person to an email that, uh, that was unanswered uh, by Dr. V uh, Vitelli. Um, I understand you're busy. Uh, however, you know, I just want to, you know, air my grievances, or, or not my grievances, but, but, just, but just go ahead and uh, um, follow up with it. Uh, second, uh, remind the masses that we are a parent, board, team, you know, every, we are all here for one person or for one reason, one reason only, and that's the students. Uh, uh, thir and thirdly, to, pr to promote uh, an American exceptionalism class or, and or uh, a, a, a religious studies class, kind of like what uh, he was saying about the Constitution. All right, firstly, uh, public trust. Uh, it, it's, 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 it's vital. It's, it's vital to, to, to what y'all do. It's vital to, you know, us trusting you uh, um, in, your, in your policies towards th that, that affect our students. Uh, so uh, at the last, after the last meeting, I recommended to Dr. Begin and Eric Joyce uh, about a town hall or a Q&A session where we can go ahead and, and ask you questions and receive answers back um, on Mike in this forum. Um, also in the email, I recommended that uh, public comments be placed in the beginning um, in the beginning of these public sessions, not not towards the end. Um, I feel I feel like there will be greater greater attendance from from parents like myself at these at these meetings. Thirdly, another recommendation is for uh, uh, um, is for these meetings to allow questions and answers during these public comments. Uh, example being, I asked you a question and you can, and you go ahead and answer it uh, right here on the spot. Uh, I feel like that that would be a huge. It'll be huge. It'll, it'll help help progress these these meetings uh, in a much better way. Uh, going on to my next topic uh, of American exceptionalism and religious studies classes. I have a, I have a couple of reasons here. Uh, one, we live in the greatest nation in the world. No, no other nation in the world do we have a, have, the, have the rights that we do. Um, for this, because as, as as stated earlier, the ethnic studies was not a, um, was not a graduation requirement. You know, these, these these classes can be you know an alternate to uh, to to those studies. It could also be an avenue for civility that was talked about earlier. Uh, it will show equity and equal opportunity for students to choose when selecting classes. Uh, even though these, these may not be favored by the board, it's a great compromise that will, that will make students well-rounded. Our nation and constitution was born on compromise. Uh, last point here, some seniors will, uh, some high school seniors will be vo of voting age and these classes of American exceptionalism and religious studies will help prepare seniors to understand the issues when they go and vote. Um, you know, a good tool. A good, a good tool here is this uh, is this report, the seventy seventy six report that was uh, uh, written by the last administration, uh, and uh, it's 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 great. And uh, this is my recommendation. And thank you for your time. Thank you for your public comment. I just want to say one thing real quick. You had a good suggestion about question and answers, but we're legally bound not to respond and deliberate about questions that are brought up during public comment that are not on the agenda because it has not been made aware to the public that we are discussing something specific. So we, it's part of our rules as a governing board that we have to make sure that the public understands what we're going to be deliberating prior to the meeting. So just to let you know. Great. Thank you. Members of the board, my name is Graham Fraser, an American by choice, longtime resident of Oceanside. Tonight I wish to speak to you about the denial by ethnic uh, denial that ethnic studies curricula offered in grades 11 and 12 does not contain major elements of divisive critical race theory. The board has said that it, uh, that it does not. The superintendent has said it, says that it is not. And I believe that's the truth. This denial position presents the following possibilities to me. You have not read the subject curricula and hence are ignorant. You, two, you approve the Marxist and divisive nature of the curriculum and hence can be fairly labeled as, as communists. 
are easily led and have no real interest in the matter. You are shills of the teachers' union cabal and hence must follow the party line without question. Which of these best fits you, I wonder? Let me remind you that your primary duty is to keep the superintendent in check. Instead of authoritarian rule prevails and it's uh, you, board members, that are being held in, che held in, in check. Um, your job is to ensure that our children are being taught how to think, not to be indoctrinated, and you just don't seem to care. Shame on you. It is not to serve the citizens, if it is not to serve the citizens of Oceanside to the check between policies of the Marxist colonial teachers, uh, California Teachers Union, and the community needs and wants, what motivates you to run and serve on the board and be, and be useful rubber stamp, I ask myself. Frankly, in my 40 years of appearing before public agencies, and I've done a lot of that uh, as an engineer, in fact, I was an engineer for the board here for 10 years, I've never seen a weaker or feckless board ever. You guys just do not take the authority that, 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 that you have. You're not looking at this uh, ethnic studies curricula. The community has not vetted it. Vitaly says that the community uh, um, has looked at it. I don't believe they have. Uh, I think you all should resign before being impeached so we can elect members that are not self-serving, truly representing our community's values and for the heart and soul of our kids and the country and have the courage that have the courage to stand against this type of indoctrination. Thank you. Rose. So first of all, I want to thank all the teachers for without them, we wouldn't be here because they taught us how to read and write and do math. And I think we need to, we need to go back to the basics and learn that. And I don't think that we should be about indoctrinating our youth that are very vulnerable with critical race theory, with gender confusion and all this other crap. I agree with other people that said we need to learn about the Constitution. We need, the, we need to do the Pledge of Allegiance. We need to teach our children respect for their elders, for teachers, for poli policemen. And the sense that I get also is like there's a climate of intimidation with you, Vitaly. And I don't know why that is. But you are here as a public servant to serve the families in this community. And as boards, you are subject to the parents and the families. You all serve us, and you're accountable to us. So you guys are the checks and balances. And so if there is intimidation with Dr. Vitelli, you guys need to fight for our children. You guys have a high responsibility. Your position here wasn't given because of your intelligence and your brilliance and your PhDs. It was given by God. And one day you will be before God and you will be held accountable for all of these things that you're allowing into our schools. And so I'm here and I'm glad that I'm here. I didn't want to be here, but it sounds like you guys need a lot of accountability. And if you guys aren't going to do the right thing, then you need to get out of the way. And you need to allow people that are going to be here fighting for our children, not causing division, bringing in all these crazy ideas of racism and white supremacy. That has no business in our schools. We need to go back to the basics of reading, writing, math, history. And these teachers, oh my gosh, they... Mesa, McGonagall. Yeah, you know who. Yeah, I figured you knew who I was talking about. Charles Finn and Re Rebecca Hill V. Yes, I couldn't read your writing. Sorry.
Good evening, school board leadership colleagues and community. I am Lynn Gonzalez, and I'm here tonight to speak regarding the impact of the pandemic on our work. I have had to deal, here's, these are the comments of our members. I have had to deal with parents who are worried and confused about the current health and safety guidelines for COVID. It seems that this information has not shared, been shared with teachers nor parents effectively. Also yesterday, I sent home the short-term student contract papers to be signed by parents. Multiple parents have contacted me. They don't understand what this form is and they want more information. Sadly, I have no information to give them because it has not been explained to me either, other than the quick video that Josh posted on the weekly newsletter. I still don't know what the policy is or how it will be implemented and by whom. Increased anxiety about getting COVID because of how close I have, have to be to students with special needs, changing diapers and managing physical behaviors, including spitting, poop throwing, self-injury, Having to enforce, having to enforce that on a on a period by period basis daily, students not having devices, students not having charged devices, parents attacking and questioning everything that I do, having to write a bazillion independent studies, trying to keep track of who is in the classroom and who is not in the classroom, who did the work, who did not do the work. This is not a normal teaching situation anymore. I am just going through the motions and hoping that something sticks. Not only am I immunocompromised due to pre-existing conditions, but so are members of my household. I have the expectation to sustain COVID-19 safety and protocol without the continued mitigation of a classroom with social distancing. S students who wear masks consistently. Then I must coordinate my own testing at home each week as at least 15 to 20 students out each day due to quarantine or exposure. I must make a decision each day on how much or which students or family members I should sacrifice in this day and in coming days as I plan to develop a curriculum that is both engaging and accessible to support SEL, student, SEL for my students, but not myself or my colleagues. Are there, any, are, are there any significant situations that directly impact your work as a result of the pandemic? That's the topic that I'm reading. Yes, lingering after effects of fatigue, headaches, brain fog that also affect my teaching. Also, student number in classes is still too high and money is being spent on other things that do not benefit the students. My work is directly impacted. Oh, it's time for a fair contract. Thank you. Good evening, OUSD School Board leadership colleagues and community. I am Lydia Mesa, a proud kinder teacher at North Terrace School, and even more proud mama of a Oceanside High freshman pirate, Go Pirates. I am here tonight to speak regarding the pandemic effects on our workload. I will be sharing responses of our recent member survey. My work is directly impacted by students being absent so often due to illness or exposure. It is difficult to plan for effective and meaningful lessons when 10 or more of my students are absent each day in my course. If we are having a, pr a provided lesson for students virtually every time they are exposed or show symptoms, symptoms, it feels like we are taking steps back as many students do not complete the independent study work due to being too sick, needing additional support, or just not wanting to do the work. The amount of time I spend doing my job has easily doubled. Are, the, are there any significant changes that have directly impacted your work as a result of the pandemic? My colleague said, I am concerned about bringing COVID to my family, even though I am fully vaccinated and take all necessary precautions. I do not believe that parents are properly reporting illnesses in order to avoid quarantine. Our school is short staffed and it puts more on the shoulders of people than there are there. My freshman thinks it's cool or funny to pull off their mask and pull it down in class and share food and drink with others. 
the lack of transparency regarding students being sick, having to prepare lessons for students working at home, the constant pressure and stress of when, I, when will I get sick. We are in charge of disinfecting our classrooms. The most important issue is student safety and learning. How does a stipend solve the problem of overcrowded third grade classrooms? There are many interruptions with students in quarantine. How will I ever catch up? Beyond that, the other things that have been added to that workload include teachers having to look for their own masks. We have kindergarten students who do not have masks that appropriately fit them. We are chasing down masks, buying our own mask, and then having to also make masks out of adult size masks and always trying to fit those to our students. Um, even though students are bringing extra masks, that's still not enough. We need masks. We are chasing down Chromebook extra chargers. We were told you'll have to buy your own at your site if you want more. The students not ha having them charged every day. I know we will always partner together to break down bridges and make Thank proceed you. in the best interest of students. We Thank need you. a fair contract now. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Charles Finn. I'm a 37-year veteran teacher, a proud Oceanside pirate. Continuing, I think there's been a lot of confusion about the policy regarding independent study and when classes and students need to quarantine. It adds a lot to our already overfilled plates to complete independent study work for students. There's an extreme increase in social emotional needs impacting all the responsibilities in the counseling office. I'm constantly worried about the health of my family, particularly my children who are too young to be vaccinated, and my mom who has cancer. It's a constant struggle to go to work every day not knowing if I will contract COVID from my school site and unknowingly transmit it to someone else. Exposure to COVID from unvaccinated office staff who don't wear masks indoors. Exposure from a fully packed class expected to recover learning loss with an especially large class size. Ongoing post-COVID long hauler symptoms. Massive, constant info tech changes being thrown at teachers. Our campus and classrooms are dirty and not being cleaned as claimed. Custodians don't show to work, and usually there are no subs or they are short-handed. Independent study is more work for teachers. Three days wait is not long enough, and teachers are getting, not getting paid for the extra work. Poor communication at our school, especially about COVID-19 infection. At our site, we usually find out from each other that a class is on quarantine. Districts should require schools' principals to inform teachers immediately about positive cases. SPED issues and support are not adjusted for full day. No support. Rooms are not getting cleaned during pandemic conditions. We're vacuuming our rooms and wiping tables at the beginning or ending of each day. Students are all over the place academically and socially, yet I have more students than I did pre-pandemic and no more support. Support teachers are not working as support. They're pulled to substitute or help admin. Our plan when they do start the support plan is more stressful and not helpful because it's an added time of day push-in that we have to fit in. Two adults and kids talking in class is very distracting. If we had smaller class sizes, we wouldn't need the support teacher. It's time. It's way past time. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Vitale and board representatives for the Oceanside Unified School District. My name is Rebecca Hilvatia. I am a teacher over at Jefferson Middle School. I am here this evening to talk to you regarding the dialogue of teacher workloads um, and the impacts of COVID-19. Um, I'm going to share with you some of the stories from our colleagues and continue this narrative. Uh, some of you know me and some of you know my own narrative, but I'll speak to my colleagues this evening. Are there any significant solutions or situations that directly impact your work as a result of the pandemic? Yes. I was shut down on day six. 
still she teaching children to care, working on building a community and dealing with SEL. I had to completely reinvent the wheel on how to teach again virtually because the curriculum offered by the district was awful. They took my Mac computer and gave me a Chromebook to zoom on, which doesn't work. Provide more tasks, more masks, and water. My kids are losing their masks. They're too sweaty, too wet. I'm providing or having to provide water bottles because their families aren't. Students were unable to go to the limited three testing sites, so many families that work just keep their kids home. The district needs testing daily. We have no online programs like ST Math or anything to offer students on IS. A large class during a health crisis, worldwide pandemic is a slap to the face. Why preach caring about health when we are literally put into these situations where our health is disregarded? There is literally no way for us to socially distance when we have a large roster. A significant situation that has directly impacted my work as a result of the pandemic is evaluating and assessing students for disabilities. It's challenging to determine a student's progress or growth. Some students lacking the capability to log in to virtual classes. Some students didn't have parental support to fully participate in virtual learning. We have also seen an uptick in requests for evaluations, which has significantly impacted my caseload and workload. IAs and kids are, more, are out more often due to testing and quarantines, self, family, et cetera, so that affects my daily schedule and ability to support students day to day. IAs need to be moved around to meet the day to day needs in my classroom or pulled to support other classrooms and students on our campus. Significant absences also affect kids' ability to progress on goals. We need a fair contract now. Thank you. The last four speakers on the topic of state of the district, Robert Hoth, Paula Orbaugh, Jennifer Skellett, and Tiffany Ortega. Good evening, board, um, leadership colleagues, and community. Um, I'm Robert Ho. I've been a resident of Oceanside now for over, gosh, over 20 years, and I've been blessed being at the same school, I came middle school for the last 25 years. So it's, it's my only job uh, off college, and I love the school I'm working for. I love working for this district. Okay. Um, most of you guys know me as a numbers person, and that's kind of what kind of butt hit. I'm based on I'm numbers right now. And I do want to clarify that what we're asking, I believe what we're asking is justified. It is COLA for our colleagues, and you hear a lot of stories about that um, this evening. And so here are some comments from our colleagues from a recent survey about kind of the state of the district itself. Okay. Um, teachers on my site have never felt more overwhelmed and less appreciated than we do now, um, whereas all the CARES Act money. Okay. I'm already putting extra hours to try to keep us up, um, to keep up with the work, and I'm, I'm at the breaking point. Um, IT in particular has um, got to start doing their job um, instead, instead of dumping into, into um, onto others. Okay, I believe we need to um, negotiate at least uh, salaries by at least you know, four to five percent. Okay, um, Casilla staff appears to be understaffed. Buildings and classrooms are not properly cleaned and sanitized. Um, lack of emotional support professionals at the secondary level. Okay. Um, my concern is that they took away our teacher's desktop. First, they didn't, they didn't take away um, my, take out my dongles, my wireless keyboard, and mouse I personally purchased. I would like them to be replaced. Okay. Second, the new teacher laptop won't connect to my 20-year-old classroom printer. I have to send anything I need to print it up to the office. How to get a single copy for that one student I can, and, and when I can't leave my classroom. And I definitely feel that in my own classroom. They're just, they're, you're just make, never making enough copies, and then um, the kids always losing their copies, and just not having a personal device to collect their own personal printer, it is a hassle. Okay? 
a majority of our staff, but our own printers and are hiking up to the office several times a day just to get that one or two copies they need for their students. Um, I know we are receiving new laptops, but my printer still won't connect to that one either, okay? Um, so here the question is, how does the tech department head keep his or her job? Okay. Um, in my, all my years of teaching, I see very little joy from the teachers. They are overworked and extremely stressed. It is too much. I dread coming back to, um, to work because the joy of teaching is gone. It is still about the test scores and data, even during a pandemic and Dallas surge. Data, um, Delta surge. Data is important, but the message is received. Um, teachers are not value unless they provide data, 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 okay? There's talk about social and emotional well-being for our students. I see teachers trying to provide this, but it, but it is challenging. Thank you workflow. for your comment, Okay, Robert. thank you very much. Good evening, board, leadership, um, staff, and community. My name is Paula Oroba. I've been in the district for about 24 years, and I am uh, currently teaching at Santa Margarita, and I am also here to speak regarding the state of the district and sharing responses from our recent member survey. Uh, let's see. I'm going to go to this one. How is it possible the DO increased their staff and there is still nobody to answer questions or held accountable for lack of support? Please advise the tech team to stop making decisions without speaking to classroom teachers regarding how to most effectively set up, test, and instruct on any and all new technology setups in classrooms. If a current setup is working, they should not take things away unless and until there has been a proper setup and training to ensure student instruction is not adversely impacted. These students have been through enough. If something is currently working, the tech team should not fix it until it makes sense to do so. For example, at a calendar break, adequate PPE is not being distributed, specifically masks. Teachers are not feeling valued or respected by district administrators. The top-down decisions that are being made and inflicted on teachers and sites contribute to this. Micromanaging should not be occurring at the top. People who are not actually working with the students are making decisions about materials that can or cannot be used. Clearly, teachers who are actually teaching the students at a personal level should be respected and trusted to make supplemental curriculum decisions. We use the district adoptions, but we also know that there are students who need supplemental materials in order to be successful. What is occurring now is sending the message that administration does not value or respect OUSD teachers. They do not trust our ability to make sound decisions. I can concur that um, at my site, many things have been sent away from district print shop because it was not district adopted materials. What is the print shop there for? <laughs> One example, oh, this is right into it, print shop, um, principals, blah, blah, blah. We are professionals who know what our students need. Teachers are not only feeling unsupported, it's worse than that. We are not feeling, we are feeling hindered, disrespected, and belittled. As the 2010, 20, 20, 2010, hmm, I don't know what this is supposed to say. The school year ended, I spent $2,000, this is last year, 2019, 20. I spent $2,000 purchasing a computer set up with two screens so that I could effectively conduct Zoom lessons for the 2021 school year because the OUSD issued iPads and Chromebooks are awful at conducting Zoom lessons. My blood pressure is very high and I will probably need to take medication for it soon. Not me, I'm fine. I used to love teaching, but now I just want to retire and deal blackjack for a living. My class is size is 34 with many meetings. The time is now. Show me the money. We need a respectful contract settlement. Hi, I'm Jen Skellett. In case you didn't know. Um, Okay, so I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to read from our survey. I think it's really important you listen with open heart, open mind. Um, there's been a lot of things that have been said tonight, and I hope you are hearing us. Uh, this is from a member. I am tired mentally, physically, and emotionally, and it's day 16. I'm done flying this plane while OUSD builds it. They had all spring and summer to figure this out. Did they? Nope. We teachers had to. If I could afford to quit, I would. Since we went to Zoom, they have expected too much from us. I know my team went above and beyond. We still are. 
and it's not appreciated. Five schedule changes last year, and this year with IS forms. Give us a break. We can't get it all done during contract times. I love working with my kids. It brings me joy to see them every day. OUSD needs to get it together. We don't have enough staff to support the needs of the school. Teachers and support staff are overwhelmed by the lack of support from the district and not having a clue on who does what at the district level. More work is being pushed to the site level and not enough support. I love teaching, but I don't love my job nearly as much as I used to due to the district's lack of support and perceived indifference. I have given my heart and soul to this district for 36 years, and I have never felt so unsupported and at a time when we need that support more than ever. I would love for the district administrators to spend just a day doing my job so they can see the challenges so they can see the challenges we face on a daily basis. We don't need all of this newfangled technology. What we need is smaller class size and additional support teachers so we can meet the academic, social, and emotional needs of those kids. Of all the years to ensure students are placed in smaller class sizes, this is the year. Students need space for health and safety. They need to have more individualized attention and instruction. They need their social emotional needs met and need to feel connect, a connection to their teacher more than ever. They need to not be crowded into a classroom and into an indoor setting that many adults would not be comfortable in, especially in the ongoing evolution of a pandemic. I provide the safest, kindest, most welcoming classroom I can, but, I truly, but it truly makes me sad that these students have been placed in such a crowded environment. We've been working in overtime to meet our students' needs since the pandemic hit and continue to do so. This has taken a toll on OUS, OUSE staff. We are exhausted and morale is low. The time is now for a fair contract. Good evening, I am not Jen Skellett. I'm Tiffany Ortega, Oceanside Teachers Association president. I'm going to read a few more of these. I think I am. I'm saddened and at times angered that our leadership chose to add more admin positions and only looking out to help admin positions workloads, but not teachers who are dealing with so many different situations in class. We went from social distancing with shields on desks and hybrid classes to full-blown overcrowded classes. I had 43 students in my sixth period until I spoke to Oda and offered to my admin to teach another class during my prep in order to reduce the size. I still have 34 kids in that class and they often forget to give wipes to me or vacuum the class. Seems the district doesn't care about social distancing or the health of its teachers, staff, or students. It is offensive and disrespectful that OUSD leadership is doing site visits to make sure we're using benchmark and to micromanage our teaching when they're not doing anything to make our day easier. High school always gets overlooked. Our students need extra support and additional teachers to help them. Without the help, they become helpless. Kids are not getting their academic needs met, way too many kids in classes, and not enough SPED teachers to provide help, plus no intervention being offered, none. It's very sad and frustrating. So I want to talk a little bit about the state of the district. This hasn't been easy for us, and it probably hasn't been easy for you to hear, but here's what I want to say. We have never in my history of 26 years had a more competent cabinet and, and superintendent. I don't think we've ever had a stronger board, and I wish that, that some people that were here talking earlier would hear me say that. We've also never had a more dedicated teaching staff in our district than we have right now. We are doing big things. We've talked about this. We're doing big things in this district. We're here for our students. We are partners in education for our students. And not one of the teachers that are here tonight, watching on TV, may have had to leave early to make lesson plans or just couldn't come tonight. None of them have any goal in mind except to provide a safe, to learn, safe learning environment for all of our students, all of our students. Also, in educating all of that student, that whole student, breaking down every barrier that there may be in doing so. And all we're asking for is to earn a fair wage while we're doing it. Thank you for your time tonight. All right. 
Do we have any more public comments, Anne? Are you sure? Okay, I'm just checking.